Oh boy, it's that time. It's time for the Parsha podcast. And I cannot be more excited for this week's installment. I think it's a very powerful idea that we're going to talk about. I think it's a very relevant idea. I think it's an idea that could really reshape how we deal with some of life's most difficult challenges. There's also a great A and Q at the end, in my opinion. And I'm looking forward. And here we begin recording from Houston, Texas, from the Torch Center. This is the Parsha Podcast. Let's begin. So our Parsha, of course, is Parsha's Korach. And Korach is Moshe and Aaron's first cousin. And it's important a little bit for the story to know their genealogy. The father of Moshe and Aaron and the father of Korach were brothers. Both of them were sons of Kehas. And Kehas had four sons. The eldest was Amram, the father of Moshe and Aaron. The next was Yitzhar, the father of Korach. The next was Hebron, and his family does not play such an active part in the story. And the youngest son of Kehas was Uziel, the father of Eli Tzaphon and Mishael. And you may remember them, actually, from the episode of the death of Aaron's two sons, Nadav and Aviyu and Parsha Shmini, back in Leviticus. They were the ones who removed the corpses of Nadav and Aviyu after they died by bringing a unrequested offering on the day of the inauguration of the temple. And Eli Tzaphon, again, the son of Uziel, the son of Kehas, So the first cousin of a lot of the important players of our parsha of Moshe and Aaron and Korach, he plays an important role in the story because back in the beginning of Numbers, chapter 3, verse 30, this Elitaphon was made the head, the Nasi, the president, if you will, of the Kahas family. So that's some of the genealogy of the background of our story. And of course, our story is based upon Korach's complaint, Korach's grievance, and Korach's revolt and rebellion that he launched against his first cousins, against Moshe and against Aaron. And he says, well, why are you guys so special? Why are you two better than us? The whole nation is holy. Everyone heard God at Sinai. And you two took more greatness than you deserved. And specifically, what Korach was aiming at, what he was gunning for, was that he wanted to be the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, instead of, or perhaps in tandem with, Aaron. And they schedule a standoff. There is an incense that's a word that I invented, 250 men plus Aaron to see who God chooses. And of course, we know the story it doesn't end up well for Korach and his co-conspirators. Some are swallowed up in a scene call, some are burned in a fire, and when the people complain, a plague wipes out 14 plus thousand until Aaron intervenes and stops the plague with incense. And that is the short version of the Korach rebellion as told in our Parsha. Let's study this story a bit deeper. Why did Korach launch his revolt, his rebellion, his mutiny? against Moshe and against Aaron? What prompted his displeasure that culminated in this rebellion and the events that ensued? So Rashi, on the first verse of our Parsha, reveals to us that Korach's complaint was rooted in something that's not even mentioned in the text of Scripture in our Parsha. Rashi tells us, why did Korach see fit to make a revolt against Moshe? He was envious at the appointment of his younger cousin, Eli Tzaphon ben Uziel, who Moshe appointed as the the president or the prince of the family of Kehas, of that Levite family, as per the instruction of God. So like I mentioned earlier, There's four brothers, the sons of Kahas. The oldest brother is Amram, the father of Moshe and Aaron. The next brother is Yitzhar, the father of Korach. And the youngest brother is Uziel. And his son is Eli Tzaphon. And Eli Tzaphon is appointed to be the head of this particular Levite family. And Korach thought that that job, to be the president of the Kahas family, belonged to him and not to his younger cousin, Eli Tzaphon. And he said, wait a minute. Our fathers, 
Moshe, your father, Aaron, your father, my father. There's four brothers, the sons of Kahas. He had four sons. And Amram, which is the oldest son, he's the firstborn. So you'd imagine that the choicest appointments would go to his side of the family. And you know what? He had two sons, Moshe and Aaron. One became king and one became the high priest. But there's another promotion available to be the prince of the tribe, or not the tribe, the family of Kehas. And who is next in line in the pecking order? Well, shouldn't it be the son of the next boy in this family, i.e. the son of Yitzhar? And therefore, I am more deserving of this appointment to be the head of the family of Kehas, and instead it went, not to me, but to the son of the youngest brother, to Elitzaphon ben Uziel. So Rashi's telling us that actually Korach wasn't prompted to have rebellion against Moshe and against Aaron because of Moshe and Aaron. It was because of Elitzaphon ben Uziel and the fact that he was appointed in lieu instead of Korach as the head of the family of Kehas. So what did he do? He launches this revolt, he launches this rebellion, and he gathers 250 important men, the majority of them from the tribe of Ruvain, and they begin the revolt. So this is the background to the story. Korach was passed over for a promotion that he thought he deserved, and that triggers him to launch a full frontal assault on Moshe and Aaron. And what ignited his displeasure was not Moshe and Aaron's promotion to King and Kohen Gadon, high priest, rather the other younger cousin, Elitzaphon, his promotion to be the head of the Kahas family. But the original grievance that he wanted to be the head of the Kahas family, that escalated to fight over things that were totally unrelated, namely Moshe and Aaron's legitimacy. Why are you better than us? You're no special. Everyone heard God. The whole nation is holy. You are illegitimate. Now, he didn't do this alone. He roused up co-conspirators. And Rashi tells us that most of them came from the tribe of Reuben. And the commentaries point out that Reuben, he too was passed up for a promotion. Because Reuben is the oldest son of Jacob. He is the firstborn, and typically the firstborn has certain perks, but all his responsibilities, all his jobs, all his titles were taken away from him. The clergy, it was originally intended to be for the firstborn for Reuben, well, that went to the tribe of Levi. The monarchy, well, who should be the king? It should be the firstborn. Originally, it was intended for Reuben. He lost it, and it went to Judah. And the double portion in inheritance, another perk of the firstborn, typically, well, that went to Joseph, who got two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So the tribesmen of Reuben also had a case for a grievance against the establishment, against Moshe and Aaron. And Korach exploited that grievance to get them to join the rebellion. And of course, it ended up very poorly for all the people involved. But here's the angel that I want to explore. Korach was not a lightweight. Rashi tells us he was a piker, he was wise, he was clever. He had a degree of clairvoyance. He was almost like a prophet. He was able to see that his descendants were going to be very righteous, including Samuel, who was equivalent to Moshe and Aaron, and that his descendants would comprise 24 shifts of singing Levites, and that his descendants would have a degree of prophecy, and that gave him confidence that he would ultimately triumph over Moshe. Clearly, Korach was a very talented and a very capable person. And you would imagine that had he been appointed the head of the family of Kahas instead of his younger cousin, the son of the youngest brother, Elitzafon ben Uziel, if that appointment instead went to Korach, and you would have Moshe the king, Aaron the high priest, and the next youngest or the next person in line in seniority in this family, Korach be the head of the family of Kehas, you would have imagined that Korach would have executed the responsibilities of that office 
with consummate still. Yet he was overlooked and he was not given that job. And the question I want to ponder is, wait a minute, Korach seems to have a good point. He was, after all, perhaps deserving of this promotion. And it was given to someone else who was less senior than Korach. Is there any merit to Korach's complaint? Did he have a legitimate grievance? That's an interesting angle to ponder. And I think this is not only an ancient question, it's a very modern one. You know, it's the story of many yeshivos, for example, that the yeshiva gets riven in two because of a dispute of succession. Who was in charge? Who has the appointment? Who was made the Rosh Yeshiva? Who was given the power? You know, I think the two largest yeshivas in the world, one in the United States and one in Israel, they're the ones who became so big and successful and popular specifically because they were the ones that managed to avoid this kind of dispute leadership. In the yeshiva world, it happens that people feel that they weren't treated properly or they should have gotten the appointment and maybe they start a little breakaway of sorts and the yeshiva splits into two. And that happens, of course, not just in the yeshiva world. It happens in the Hasidic courts. All the time it happens. The grand rabbi dies and he leaves multiple sons, each one of them apparently qualified to be the successor and each vying for the job and each worthy to be the successor. And you only have one crown and you have two or maybe even more, aspirants for it. And you can imagine, suppose you're the son of the grand rabbi, and your whole life you've been preparing for this moment, you've been groomed for it, and you have the chops, and you have the skill, and you have a following, and you have a claim to the throne. And suppose you're even the older son, maybe you're even the greater scholar, and you have the more impressive resume. And you have the more striking rabbinic persona. But somehow, your younger brother gets the nod. Someone more junior, perhaps less talented than you, gets the job. That's what happened to Korach. And what now? So it happens often that there's a bifurcation. You have a great dynasty that's split into two. And that's happened many, many times in the Hasidic world. This is not only something which happens in a religious or rabbinic context. In every area of life, you have people who are disappointed when they're passed over for positions or for promotions. You know, the military. Everyone's obsessed in the military with rank, with position, with seniority, with authority. And everyone wants to be promoted. And people get really worked up about it. And everyone has their ego. And why does that person get promoted to be a general? Why do they get a commission? Why do I only have a two-star? I'm only a two-star general. They're a three-star general. And that's a very difficult thing to swallow. And you have sometimes a legitimate grievance. There's a job, a company, or an organization. And there's lots of people. And someone gets passed over for promotion. And maybe the person who was promoted is less talented and less capable than you. And you stay an associate. Everyone else is promoted. They're they're the managers. They're the boss. They're the CEO. And you're more gifted and you're more talented and your superior is less capable than you. Or at least that's how it appears to you. What do you do? How do you process that? What should Korach have done? He was passed over. He had the credentials. He had the ability. He had the pedigree. He was more senior. And yet, there was a job to be had. Who was going to be the prince, the president of the family of Kos? And that title, and that job, and that rank, and that promotion went to someone more junior than him. And of course, Korach did not take this calmly. It caused him envy and bitterness, and he mounted a revolt. How should Korach have processed it? Or maybe from a different angle, why indeed was he passed over for this 
promotion. He clearly was a very talented person. And I think for us as well, what do you do when you're in such a situation? How ought a person in such a predicament process this? What is the proper way? What is the Torah way to respond when you were passed over for promotion and you believe that you're deserving of that and someone else gets that? So I think the easiest answer to this question is found in Rashi that we just read, the first Rashi, or the Rashi in the first verse of the Parsha. Who made the appointment to appoint Eli Tzaphon, the son of Uziel, to be the head of the family of Kos? That was not a unilateral decision of Moshe. In fact, Moshe did not even make the decision. That decision was made by God. It was the Almighty's decision, not Moshe. This is not a human decision. It's a godly, divine decision. And therefore, Korach should have accepted it. Is that a good answer to the question? Just accept it? Maybe. Maybe that's the right answer. Maybe we should just stop the recording, stop the podcast, call it a day, and say we have the answer. We have the secret. We found Korach's mistake. But I want to ponder this today a little bit further. So God made the decision to pass over Korach. Doesn't that compound the question? Doesn't that exacerbate the problem? If Korach was eminently qualified, as we are, I think, fairly assuming, why would God appoint his younger, more junior cousin, Elitzafon ben Uziel, to the role of the prince of the family of Kahas? Why would the Almighty, who loves everyone, loves every one of his children, so to speak, love Korach, you'd imagine? Why did he do it to him? Why didn't Korach get the nod? So here's what I want to suggest. Tell me if you buy it. We believe that every single person is put here with a mission to accomplish. In fact, there's a striking Rambam. I'm sure we've mentioned it in the past. If we haven't, we got to mention it pretty often. The Rambam tells us that every single human who was created, so we're talking about billions of people, can become as great as Moses. Now, that's, of course, a very shocking statement because the Torah itself says that no one can be a prophet like Moshe, or at least no one amongst the Jewish people can be a prophet like Moshe, and we can't be prophets at all. How can we be like Moshe? So the answer, of course, is that on an absolute scale, we cannot become prophets and certainly not a prophet of the caliber of Moshe. But that doesn't mean that we cannot, on a relative scale, become as great as Moshe. Moshe was the greatest man that ever lived. He unlocked 100% of his gargantuan ability and maximized his potential. If I unlock 100% of my comparatively tiny potential, but I do 100%, on a relative scale... I am as great as Moshe. Moshe maximized his opportunities and I maximize my opportunities. But here's the thing. Everyone is different. Everyone is unique. And everyone has a different path to achieve their potential to unlock their greatness. But feeble and mortal man does not know and, and really cannot know what situation is ideal for them, what buttons they need to press, to be able to become complete, to achieve their mission, to achieve their perfection. So everyone is unique, everyone's different, and everyone has a different path to their perfection. And you don't come into life with a neat, handy manual to know exactly what to do. So how do you discover what path you need to take? And the answer is, is that we don't know. We have to submit ourselves to the Almighty and allow Him to guide us. We believe that the Almighty tailor makes a unique, individual, personalized path to greatness for every person. And the Almighty is going to manipulate your environment and the circumstances of your life to place you and position you in the situation that will allow you, that will at least give you a shot to be able to fulfill your potential. And for everyone, it's unique, 
and different and individualized. And therefore, we could suggest the following. For some people, their greatness is achieved when they are promoted to a certain official task or role, responsibility, or position. So you have Moshe. He is made the king, and that is the Almighty positioning Moshe to become the greatest man that ever lived. And Aaron is made the high priest, and Joshua, etc. Every person who was given an official promotion or role, that is the Almighty saying, in this particular environment is how you find your greatness. But some people, their path to greatness is precisely orchestrated by them not getting a promotion. So here's the suggestion. Korach was loved by the Almighty. The Almighty loves everyone. And the Almighty wanted Korach to flourish and become great and to achieve his individual perfection tailor-made for Korach. And the way the Almighty orchestrated that is that he passed over Korach for this promotion. And Korach would have achieved his greatness and perfection by sitting on the sidelines and submitting himself to others that were perhaps less talented and less, quote-unquote, deserving than him. And he was older than them, and he was more senior than them. And seeing someone else shine and getting all the plaudits and all the accolades and perhaps absorbing a little bit of pain that comes with that and swallowing your pride and biting your lip, that's what you, Korach, need to do to unlock your greatness. For some, greatness is accomplished via commission. For others, greatness is accomplished via omission. Korach, indeed, had a grievance. He was passed over for a promotion that he thought, and we, I think, would say, think the same, that he rightfully deserved. But that was orchestrated by God. The Almighty designed that to create the optimal circumstances in which Korach could have unlocked his true full potential. Maybe we could even speculate, you know, what determines if someone's path to greatness includes a promotion, a position, a title, a rank, authority, power, or not. So perhaps we could suggest that if you really want it, if you crave and lust for power, in all likelihood, your path to greatness is you being forced to sit on the sideline. And, you know, Moshe, the paradigmatic leader of all, remember back in Exodus, Moshe spends seven days vigorously objecting to become a leader. Moshe fought tooth and nail to avoid a leadership role. He didn't want the promotion. And his path to greatness was to overcome that and to accept the mantle of leadership. And err in the same way. There's an amazing Ramban in the beginning of our parsha, verse 4. It says that when Korach launched the revolt, Moshe fell on his face. The Ramban points out that Aaron did not fall on his face because he thought that Korach had a point. He thought that Korach indeed would make a better high priest than him. Crazy thing. Aaron is the high priest and he's like, you know what? Korach actually has a good point. I think he would be a, a, better, a better person to fulfill this role. And the Rabban actually says a beautiful line. The only reason why Aaron maintained the position of high priest was him following the decree of God. So you have Moshe and Aaron. They're both resisting leadership and their path to greatness compelled them to overcome that. They weren't power hungry. They were humble and their mission was to become a leader and to take an official leadership position amongst their brethren. That's what they needed to do to become great. Korach was the opposite. He craved power. He lusted for a promotion. For him, it would be more difficult to withhold from the promotion, to yield to someone else, and not surprisingly, the unique, individual, tailored, personalized path for Korach demanded that he not get that promotion. And that would be a great blessing for him. That would be the Almighty positioning him to achieving his max. Korach thought that getting the job, he thought he deserved it, 
that would be his ticket to achieving his perfection. But the Almighty had a very different idea. And he designed a path for him where Karach would not get the nod. And that would be the way that he would fulfill his mission. This is, I think, a novel idea. It made sense, but it's surprising because we think of a promotion as a good thing. Here we're saying that the Almighty, by not promoting Korach, that is the good thing. The absence of a promotion, maybe even a demotion, is positive for some people. And you may say, hey, Wolby, I don't buy that. A promotion's always good. You may say that. And I'll point you to a precedent for this. I will show you a precedent wherein a demotion or a lack of a promotion is a good thing. All the way back at the end of Genesis, Jacob is about to die. He's on his deathbed and he gathers all his sons and he gives them a blessing. And before the section starts, this is chapter 49 of Genesis, Jacob says, I will give you all a blessing. And after that section concludes, Jacob reiterates and says this, or the Torah reiterates and says, this was the blessing that Jacob gave his sons. Well, evidently from the text, what Jacob conveyed to his sons was a blessing. And you look at what he told Reuben, and it says, you, Reuben, you are impetuous like water, and you would have been king, and you would have been the firstborn, and you would have been a priest, but I'm taking it away from you. Congratulations. I hope you enjoy your blessing. Evidently, from the text, it's clear that for Reuben, it was a blessing to be demoted. There's a precedent for this idea, and we can extend it to Korach. Who decided that Korach was not going to get the promotion? It was God, not Moshe. And you know what? For him, that would have been a blessing. Now, of course, it's not exactly the same because Reuben was the firstborn and it was like a demotion for Reuben. For Korach, it's just a lack of promotion, but the principle is the same that although Korach had the ability and he was capable, and he was wise, and he was a clairvoyant, his mission was to watch someone else get that job that he thought was rightfully his, and that would be a blessing for him like it was for Reuben, and that's how he would have achieved his greatness. Now, I want to prove this point from an amazing story in the Talmud. One of the most wonderful stories It's a beautiful story from a Talmudic perspective, also from a historical perspective, and it's talking about what happened in the first century before the Common Era, a very tough century for the Jewish people. And the Jews at the time were living, some of them were in Israel and some were in Babylon. And in Israel, the Sanhedrin was being headed by a family called the Bnei Beseir, the sons of Beseir. Our sages tell us that there were three sons and they were the triumvirate that was heading the Sanhedrin at that time. But there was a question, a halachic question, that they did not know the answer to. And the question was, what happens when Pesach, Passover, falls out on a Saturday night, so right after Shabbos, so you go from Shabbos straight into the festival, and the day before Pesach, you're supposed to bring a sacrifice, the pastoral offering, but does the pastoral offering that you bring before Pesach, in the event that the day before Pesach is a Shabbos, does the Paschal offering override the Shabbat or not? That was a question that was posed to the Sanhedrin, to the, the Jewish Supreme Court, the High Court in Jerusalem, headed by this family, and they didn't know the answer. And they started to explore, is there anyone around here that maybe knows the answer? And at that time, the great Hillel had emigrated from Babylon. And he had previously actually been in Israel and studied under the great Shemai and Avtalion, the great sages of the previous generation. And someone suggested, hey, go speak to Hillel. Hillel is a great scholar and he studied under the tutelage of of these great scholars of the previous generation. And maybe he knows the answer. So they went and they summoned Hillel. And Hillel says... I have actually three proofs that indeed 
when Pesach falls out on a Saturday night, that Saturday, that Shabbos, you are permitted to offer the pastoral sacrifice. It does override Shabbos. And he brings conclusive proof. And the sons of Becerra, the heads of the Sanhedrin, the princes of the people, they make a dramatic decision. They abdicate their throne and they say, Hillel, we are giving the kings of the kingdom to you. We're going to step aside. We're going to step down. We're going to abdicate our position. And you henceforth are the leader of the Sanhedrin. You are going to be the Nasi. You're going to be the president of the Jewish people. These people were the heads of the Sanhedrin, the Bnei Besar, the sons of Becerra, these elders, leaders of the Jewish people, heads of the Sanhedrin, and they voluntarily forfeited their power, gave up their position, abdicated the throne in favor of Hillel, and Hillel and his family led the Sanhedrin for almost 400 years, son after son, heads of the Jewish people, until the Sanhedrin disbanded in the 4th century of the Common Era. Now, the Talmud tells us that the reward that this family, that these three sages, the sons of Becerra, the, the reward that they had for forfeiting power is as follows. It says that they forfeited their crown in this world, and as a result of that, they inherited eternal reward in the afterlife. These three people, the sons of Becerra, they walked away from power, they yielded their position, and what does the Talmud say about them? In that merit, they earned eternal reward in the afterlife. Now, when we say someone earns eternal reward in the afterlife, that means that they accomplished their mission in this world. And therefore, because they checked off, so to speak, what they needed to do in this world, they could cash in, so to speak, in the afterlife. They've accomplished their mission here, and now they can move on to the next world of reward, of compensation for fulfilling your mission. So, again, the, the Talmud makes it clear that the reason why they accomplished their mission is because they forfeited their power, meaning that their mission was to forfeit their power. The same mission that Reuben was given, the same blessing that Reuben was given, and the same test, so to speak, that was presented for Korach, or similar, because again, Korach didn't forfeit it, but he didn't accept the lack of promotion. Now, what's implied from this Talmud what would have happened had the Bnei Becerra, had this family that was ruling the Sanhedrin, had they not forfeited the power, had they not given the keys to Hillel? Well, implied from this Talmud is that they would have not unlocked their potential and achieved their greatness, if not for this. Like Korach, their path demanded that they give up on something. Unlike Korach, they were up to the task and they earned eternal reward, whereas Korach failed this lesson and he earned eternal ignominy. Now, I think that we could also prove that of these two paths of the greatness via commission, via a promotion, via a position, versus the other path, the path that Korach was supposed to go on, the greatness via omission of these two paths, forfeiting power is actually much harder. Meaning, perhaps we can even say, and this sounds crazy, but maybe we can even say that, that the task given to Korach, step aside and allow your younger cousin to rule, that may have been a greater task, a more difficult path than the one given to Moshe and Aaron, which was not to step aside, but to step up. I'll give you an example. Back to the story of the Bnei Becerra. We have this family. They're the rulers. They're the Nassim. They're the presidents. They're the head of the Sanhedrin. They're the leaders. They walk away. And they give the keys to Hillel. And Hillel's son is Shimon. And he is his successor. And his son Shimon is Gamliel. And his son is Shimon. And his son is Gamliel. 
And his son is Shimon, and his son is Rabbi Judah the Prince. And that continued on, of course, for many generations, even after Rabbi Judah the Prince. So six generations after Hillel, Hillel's descendant, Rabbi Judah the Prince, lauded and extolled the Bnei Baser, the Baser family that forfeited the crown to his antecedent Hillel, and he spoke about them reverentially. Talmud says that Rabbi Judah the Prince, who again was the prince, successor to Hillel six generations later, he said about himself the following, I could do anything. I'm up to any task. But there's one thing I can't do. There's one thing that's just beyond me. I cannot do. I don't have the strength of character to do what the Bnei Basera did by forfeiting the throne to Hillel, my ancestor. Nevertheless, says Rabbi the Prince, if Rav Huna, who was the head of the Jews in Babylon, Rabbi the Prince was in Israel, in the land of Israel. If Rav Huna came from Babylon to the land of Israel, I would be forced to mimic the Bnei Becerra, and I would indeed give up the throne to him, because after all, he's from the tribe of Judah, and I'm from the tribe of Judah only from my mother's side, but from the father's side, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, and therefore he has a greater claim to the throne. So if Rav Huna, in the unlikely event that he shows up from Babylon, I indeed would follow the ways of Bnei Becerra, but that would be very, very difficult for me. And one time, concludes the Talmud, his nephew walks in and says, guess who's here? Rav Huna's here. Rav Huna's outside. And right away, Rabbi the Prince's face started turning colors. He's like, oh no, what's going to be? I promised I'm going to give my throne to him. But his nephew told him, no, he, he's outside. But he is deceased. And they're bringing him to bury him, to inter him in the Holy Land. So Rabbi the Prince the official head of the Jews. He has a greater position than any one of his countrymen, any one of his co-religionists. His path, of course, was to become the great leader, the official leader of the people. And he testified about himself that he would not be able to pull off what the Bnei Becerra did. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, what they did was slightly different from what Korach was asked to do. They abdicated a position they already had, and he was asked only to forego a position that he thought he deserved, but the thrust of it is the same. It's not easy to do what Korach was asked to do. It requires immense strength of character to swallow your shame and accept that you were passed over for a job. But it was specifically because Korach was such a gifted person and such a great man that he was given such a tall order. Now, because it's already, I don't know, 39 minutes or so into the podcast, I'll tell you a story. Most of you already tuned out already. Most people said, oh, Walby is droning. He is bloviating. He is talking nonstop. They already turned off or they fell asleep. So whoever's here, I'll tell you a story. My grandfather, of blessed memory, Rabbi Shlomo Wolby, who I've talked, who I've talked about a lot, of course. In 1948, he founded a yeshiva in a city called Be'er Yaakov, outside of Tel Aviv or a suburb of Tel Aviv, in Israel. And he founded this institution in a time where it was incredibly difficult to open a yeshiva. And they suffered through literal starvation. That's how bad things were. And multiple times you almost closed it because they had no food to feed the students or even the faculty members. But he persevered and he built a magnificent yeshiva, one of the greatest yeshivas of its kind of its time. Six months after he opened the yeshiva, he brought in a partner who's going to be the fellow head of the yeshiva. And like we know, the great yeshivos, they have two heads. There's what's called the Rosh Yeshiva and the Mashiach, the kind of the spiritual dean and the head of the yeshiva. That's the way most yeshivos, that's the kind of the, the leadership structure. And this yeshiva spawned many great students. It was considered to be one of the premier yeshivas of its time. And this is my grandfather's life's work. 
But for reasons that he refused to talk about, he always struggled working in tandem with his partner. And in 1983, he unilaterally and voluntarily walked away from the empire that he built, left the yeshiva, gave the keys over to his partner, and said, I don't want to fight, I don't want to have disagreements, I'm leaving. And he refused to ever open his mouth to say why he made that decision. He swallowed it, refused to allow anyone to know what happened. And 20 some odd years later when he passed and he opened up his last will and testament, he writes to his descendants, one of the main subjects of his last will and testament is don't make a claim on the buildings of that yeshiva. Even though he was the rightful owner, his name is on the deed, he forfeited it. He walked away from it. To do that demands a tremendous amount of strength of character. It's not easy at all. And I don't think that most of us would be up to the task. And of course, in a very, very different realm, Long-time listeners know how much I admired the great General George Washington. And if you study his story, after the War of Independence, so 1783, George Washington could have easily made himself king, dictator for life over the United States of America. And he walked into Congress, and he resigned his commission. He went to the Continental Congress, and he walked away from power. He could have become king. He could have consolidated his power and no one would have flinched. But he walked away. And when King George of England heard about that, he says if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. And by the way, after his second term as president in, I think it was, uh, what, 1797, he did it again. He voluntarily walked away from power. He opts out of power. He makes his famous farewell address, and he leaves. And it's been speculated that that's the reason why this republic took off. It's because of someone having that great strength of character to be able to walk away from power. It's not easy at all. Of course, the cynic would say, well, George Washington didn't have any kids. If he had kids, who knows? Maybe this republic would not be what it is or became. That is an argument for the scholars. Korach, indeed, was a great man. He had a grievance that in our eyes seems to be very legitimate. He was passed over for a promotion to someone who was perhaps less deserving than him. But he made a mistake. His critical mistake was not learning this lesson. This is orchestrated by God. This path specifically is the one that you are destined to take to achieve your maximum. Unfortunately, he failed the test. It wasn't an easy test. It's maybe the hardest thing to do to walk away from power, or at least to accept that you were passed over for power. He failed the test, and he suffered the concomitant consequences. I think this is a very, very valuable lesson for us. When you feel underappreciated, perhaps by your boss, overlooked, passed over like Korach, hey, this is a job, this is a promotion, I should be having, why must I be subordinate to this person who's dumber than me, who makes terrible decisions? Why is no one recognizing me? Why don't I have the position, the rank, the authority that I justly deserve? We ought to remember that it's quite possible that our particular path to greatness hinges on us specifically not having this promotion. And yes, It's a bitter pill to swallow. Reuben, I'm sure you're happy. Aren't you delighted that you lost your priesthood, the firstborn rights in the monarchy? What an amazing blessing. Can you imagine afterwards the brothers are like, oh my God, what what did he bless you with? Oh, 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 Judah, you were blessed to be this king and power and all that. 
uh, Ruben, what's your blessing? Well, my blessing is is that uh, yeah, I lost this and I lost that and I'm no longer be there. What a great blessing. Eh, good for you. Great job, Ruben. Aren't you happy? Aren't you delighted? To actually accept that and to see that as a blessing is very, very hard. And only the greats are able to achieve it. And indeed, we have examples of people that did it. We have the B'nai B'Seira that Rabbi Shur, the Prince testifies about himself. He couldn't do it. It's a very difficult thing, but what they do, they forfeit the crown of this world, and through that they achieved their mission, and they were able to earn eternal merit, because now you've accomplished your mission, and now it's time for you to move on to the next world. This task is specifically given to the more capable and to the more gifted among us. Korach was destined to be like that, but unfortunately, he failed that test. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q answers and questions. And I'm really, really excited about this question. After the Korach debacle, there was another reverberation. The people complained. This is chapter 17, verse 11. And a plague began. And then Moshe tells Aaron, grab the shovel and put in it fire and bring katoras and bring incense because... The plague has started. So Aaron indeed does as instructed. He grabs the shovel and he runs amidst the congregation. The plague had begun and he starts offering the katoras and he stands between the living and the dead. And indeed, the plague stopped, but not before there were 14,700 casualties in this plague. Now, why did Moshe tell Aaron to bring incense so Rashi quotes the Talmud, and we might have mentioned this in the past, that when Moses was in heaven to get the Torah, he had this scuffle with the angels, and ultimately he won them over, and each one of the angels gave Moshe a gift. And the angel of death gave Moshe the following bit of information, the following secret, and that is that when there is a plague, the way to stop the plague... The antidote to a plague is ketoris, is incense. And therefore, a plague has erupted. The angel of death is romping through the people. Moshe remembers that. He tells Aaron, okay, grab the ketoris, grab the incense, and go stop this plague. And indeed, it worked. And there's an amazing dialogue in Rashi, how the angel of death says to Aaron, get out of my way, I need to go finish this plague. That's what the Almighty wants. And Aaron says, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm here by Moshe. Moshe wants me to stop you, and I have the Ketoras, and you can't go. And he's like, well, God sent me. And he says, well, Moshe sent me, and Moshe would never send me if it was against the will of God. And eventually they went in front of God and Moshe, and indeed Aaron and the Ketoras and the incense triumphs over the angel of death and his plague. And here's the question. Incense, we're told, is the antidote to the angel of death to plagues. Why specifically is incense the antidote to the angel of death to plagues? Why does incense stop plagues? That is this week's A and Q. If you have an answer, send me an email. And I know this is a very difficult question. I'll give you a little bit of a clue. I don't know how helpful this is. If you are someone, and I know I've gotten emails in the past, people say, I've listened to all of your podcasts. And therefore, if you're someone who's listened to all the podcasts, you have all the information that you need to have the answer. Because the building blocks of the answer, in my opinion, there may, be, there may be many answers. But the building blocks of the answer is found in previous episodes of the Parsha podcast. If you combine what we suggested about incense, with what we suggested about plagues, I think you will get the answer. Moreover, I think if you put those two together, the answer will be obvious. But of course, you don't need to rely on me. You can rely on yourself. Come up with your own answer and send it to me in an email to rabbiwalby at gmail.com, R-A-B-B-I-W-O. O-L-B-E at gmail.com. Okay, last week we asked a question as to whether or not being two-faced is a good thing or a bad thing. 
Caleb is praised for being two-faced. One in the heart and one in the mouth, whereas Joseph's brothers are being praised for the opposite, for not being for not being one in the mouth and one in the heart. So I really like this question, and I think there are a lot of ways to approach it. I want to share with y'all a few thoughts. Some of them were suggested by listeners. Some of them, I think, won't fully answer the question, but will spice it up a bit. So let's start with some spice. So first of all, connecting the story of the spies to the story of Joseph and his brothers is something that the Kabbalists actually do. The Kabbalists tell us that the ten spies that went rogue were the reincarnations of the ten brothers who sold Joseph. We have groups of twelve where ten of them do something that's uh, inappropriate, that's incorrect, that's wrong, and that appears twice in the Torah. It's not a coincidence. Tell us the Kabbalists, because actually these are the same people in different manifestations. These are the reincarnations of those ten people, meaning that these stories are interrelated. In fact, when... Joseph is installed as viceroy of Egypt, and the brothers come before him. He labels them as spies. You are miraglim, spies. And in fact, in our parsha, or last week's parsha, parsha shlach, it talks about the spies, but they're actually not labeled as spies. The only time the Torah uses the term spies is vis-a-vis Joseph's ten brothers. Moreover, Caleb, as we mentioned last week, was the father of Hur. And Hur, when the mob threatened to make the golden calf, Hur did not mask his true beliefs, did not separate between his heart and his mouth, and he died as, as a result of that. And the Kabbalists point out that in our section, which talks about Caleb, who had a different spirit, the word for spirit is ruach, a resh, a vav, and then a ches, which is the exact same letters as the word Hur. The only difference is, is that they're flipped the other way around. Chur is ches vav resh, and ruach is resh vav ches. And Caleb has the opposite of chur, almost as if Caleb learned from chur's mistake and did the opposite by being two-faced. Perhaps even implying that Caleb did what chur should have done in his situation. But there are some answers, I think, that are that are legitimate. Now that we have some spice, let's give a little bit substance. And I think the a basic answer is that being two-faced can be manifested in different scenarios. To be two-faced in an expedient fashion is a problem. And the brothers are praised for not being like that. Caleb was not being two-faced for expedient or selfish reasons, but rather to fight back against the mob who wanted to condemn the entire people and being two-faced in that situation is actually great. Using deception to save the nation is actually laudable. In fact, Jacob, who is the paragon of being someone who's honest and someone whose mouth and heart are united, he declares that I can turn on my deception when it's proper. He says regarding Laban, Achiv Ani Baramos, I am his brother in deception. And we know that Caleb paid a visit to Hebron, maybe picked up a little bit of Jacob's influence. So that's one idea, that the context of the deception was different in the case of the brothers versus Caleb. But even on a the most basic angle, this question of of Caleb and Hur reminded me of the classic line in Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I read quite studiously as a teenager. He brings an epithet that appeared on a gravestone. It said the following, Here lies the body of William J., who died maintaining his right of way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along. But he's just as dead now as if he were wrong. So, of course, Hur is a great hero. And we've spoken about him quite laudably and admirably in the past. But he stuck to his principles. 
and that's why he died. He's just as dead now as if he were wronged. And Caleb did not make that mistake. And he said, you know what? If I'm going to die, if the people are going to die as a result of that, it's better for me to play around a little bit, to be a little bit dishonest. This would be a good time to do that. I thank you for listening. This was such a joy, such a delight to study this week's Parsha and the Korach story with you this week. I hope you enjoyed. If you didn't, send me an email. If you did, you can also send me an email. Rabbi, what would you want to come? Have a fabulous rest of your week. A wonderful and splendid and happy and tranquil and serene and delightful Shabbos. And please, God, we will talk again in good health and in great spirits. United in heart and mouth. Next week.